Hello, everyone, and welcome to 170th episode of The Intellectual Podcast. I'm your host, David Dawson. And before I get into the show, I'd like to say a very special congratulations to the intellectual film team. Our 48-hour film project experimentation went very well. We did the two films over the weekend, as we had spoken about. Those films were Bittersweet Fortune and Discontinuance, which were narratively connected movies. Uh, One was a coming-of-age film that focused on the young daughter uh, of the story, and the other was a sci-fi film that focused on the father of the story. Both films were well-received at the presentation the other night, um, with Discontinuance, the film that was directed by my very good friends Diego Robles and Leon Bahar, and written by Martin Gomez, uh, from a story created by Marianne Bates and Martin Gomez. Um, Discontinuance was selected as second runner-up or third place in the audience choice for our screening group at the 48. Congratulations. And we recently found out that it's also been selected as one of the best ofs for this year's 2016 San Diego 48-hour film project. So a huge, huge dose of congratulations to the film team. This is the first time we've had one of our films show up in the best of since we began doing these films for the 48 in 2007. So it's a really big deal. I'm super proud of everybody. And on top of that, we also know that uh, Mike Peterson and Bill Bork are up for uh, best cinematographers uh, for the film as well. So um, a huge mountain of support to the guys. Uh, I hope that you win. I will not be able to attend the best of screenings and the awards show uh, as I am back in New York. And actually Whitney Wigman will not be attending because she'll be here in New York on Thursday as well uh, for a big interview we're doing for a special secret project. Um, But anyway, we wish you guys the best. Um, All of you who will be representing the films at the uh, awards show, have a wonderful time. And if you are in San Diego this Thursday night, that's September um, September 15th, um, go online, San Diego 48-Hour Film Project. You can find them on Facebook. And uh, purchase your tickets to the Best of screening and see the best films that uh, the San Diego 48-Hour Film Project produced this year, one of which was Discontinuance, our film. And uh, also um, the NBL uh, from Mike Miner and Bad MF. Uh, they're also in the, in the group. And I believe Michael Brugemeyer's film uh, from Team Alloy is also there. So there's a good group of, good group of films uh, in the best of. Um, of course, snubs, as always, for some films that probably should have made it, but for whatever reason didn't. But for once, we're in that group, so I'm really pleased and happy for the team. So uh, if you can make it out Thursday night, that's tomorrow night, please do. If you can't, uh, be sure to check out theintellectual.com as we uh, update uh, on the future happenings with these films. Uh, We will be submitting them to film festivals in the future and doing a, a combined... Uh, story version where we bring both films into one film as well so uh, look for all that down the line today well today is a special episode I'm coming at you from New York that's right I'm on a East Coast tour uh, out here for some work uh, working in Jersey and then working in Philly and working in Chicago and while I'm back east I'm making the most of the time back east to talk to people that I think you might find interesting, and there it is. Um, Carla set this interview up. It's with Stella Sensel. You may know her from Face Off if you're a fan of the makeup show that I believe airs on sci-fi. And uh, she is delightful, and we met uh, in a little coffee shop in Brooklyn. and just had a, a really nice chat. Um, it's been a while since I've really kind of done a podcast by myself, so it was um, kind of interesting to show up somewhere completely unknown 
and meet up with somebody I've never spoken to before and carry a conversation for an hour. But it was actually very, very easy because Stella is, like I said, an absolute delight. So here she is, Stella Sensel, the first of several interviews that will be coming from New York City on the Intellectual Podcast. This is episode number 170. Talk hard and enjoy the mindgasm. The Intellectual Podcast starts now. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Intellectual Podcast. I'm your host, Dave Dawson, and I'm sitting in Brooklyn. Uh, the first uh, chat of the Intellectual Podcast in the New York area, and I'm sitting with Face Off contestant Stella Sensel. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you so much for sitting down and chatting with us. No problem. Um, my sister and my brother-in-law are huge fans of Face Off. I have to confess, I stopped watching after about season two. Okay. Um, it's I'm, changed a lot since yeah, then. Yeah, well, I'm just too, I'm too busy trying to make my own stuff. You <laughs> yeah. know how that goes, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know how much TV do you get to watch yourself. Not much. I have to pick right. and choose. Right. Those of us who make stuff don't really get to enjoy it, right? Yeah. Um, but I loved the show in the first couple seasons. And like I said, my sister and my brother-in-law keep watching and they're, they're my co-producers mm-hmm. on my films and stuff. And so like, they're always watching for inspiration and whatnot. And so I told my sister, I was going to be chatting with you today. And she's like, no way. <laughs> she's like, she was really good. And I'm like, great. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. Oh, thanks. Um, how did you get onto face off? Let's just start with that. Uh, you actually have to audition. It's a kind of a crazy process. Um, first, you send them a video of yourself doing makeup on yourself. And uh, you send them like all these pictures of your portfolio. <clears throat> and then they'll invite you to come out for like a formal audition. And that's kind of where you meet the producers and all the people you kind of have to sell yourself to them. Like, <laughs> why should I be on this show? It was, it was a strange process to someone who's not in, used to that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. Did you find that the process lent itself to the best makeup people or more to the best personalities? I think... Because we always wonder that when we're watching the shows. I think it, they look for both. They look for great makeup artists who also have great personalities. Um, cause it, how boring would it be to watch a show, of a bunch of dull people, <laughs> <laughs> talented, but dull, you know, right. It wouldn't be that fun. Right. Um, so you live in New York city. Mm-hmm. I live in Brooklyn Bushwick, actually a few blocks from here. Uh, have you always lived here? No, I've lived all over New York city. Yeah. Yeah. Well- just about every borough except for. Bronx and Staten Island. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm actually going to be staying in the Bronx uh, starting tomorrow. So good luck. <laughs> so we'll see how that goes. <laughs> um, well, I used to hear the same kind of thing about Brooklyn, the good lucks and stuff. Yeah, so. there's New York's changed. I've, I've only been here a few times, but mm-hmm. I've only been here in the last, say, 10 years or so. But even in the time that I've been coming, it's it like keeps radically changing. different each time it I come. It keeps changing. It's forever changing. Yeah. This neighborhood used to be a really dangerous neighborhood. And now look at it. Like we're sitting in a coffee shop. Quaint coffee shop. In in the middle of Bushwick where you wouldn't even want to walk down the street like 10 years ago. Right. You'd be scared. <laughs> well, that's a good thing though. Yeah. Right? Yeah, so. absolutely. Um, as a New York native, how did you get into... I think I saw that you you studied theater and acting and everything else. How did you get into the creative arts? Um, well, I started really young. I I went. I actually grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and uh, they. I have, like Wisconsinites. I got a lot of friends from yeah, Wisconsin. Wisconsin's a great place to grow up, and uh, there's performing arts schools there. There's a elementary school. There's a middle school and a high school. I think there's two middle schools there performing arts which I think is great because um, I don't I think there's nothing more important than exposing children to the arts Mm -hmm. at a young age yeah it ends up 
creating really well-rounded individuals who can respect um, they can respect the arts in all its different forms like they what? teach you they uh, teach you how to be an audience member yeah I mean seriously like yeah. I was like th- thinking how strange it was to be told how I needed to act while I sat and watched a performance but seriously like these days <laughs> If some places you go and you're like, what is wrong with people? Why can't they sit and watch a movie like a normal person? Like, That's a weird thing. It's yeah. like the whole concept of etiquette has mm-hmm. just been thrown out the window. It really has. You it know, really like n- nobody knows how to respect anybody else. It's, it's all about me and my personal bubble. And I don't care if it affects yeah. anyone around me. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's really I, I was thinking about that even while I was on the subways the last couple of days. Mm-hmm. Just watching all the people who are buried in their phones and not paying any attention to the world around them and watching people just bumping into each other. You know, right. like their stop I'm, comes up and they get up and they just walk right into I'm someone. Definitely guilty of <laughs> being buried in my phone on the subway. Um, but, but seriously, this this is why. Like you're forced to like get really close to people on the subway. Closer than is comfortable, like everyone's inside of your own personal bubble and you're like, right. Oh, just don't touch me. I already <laughs> smell you. It's like, you don't want to pay. You just don't want to pay attention to them. Like New York's a really hard place to live. And if you can like get a moment of peace and even if that's burying yourself in your phone on your ride to work, I'm for it. Well, I had, I had a weird experience. It's not weird. I mean, it's probably a typical New York experience, but I got into the sub last night. I was heading back really late. And I was buried in my phone because mm-hmm. I was trying to figure out where the hell I was going. <laughs> so I get into the train and I sit down and I just like mindlessly sat down. And I noticed a couple people sat down on the bench across from me and then immediately got up and walked off. And I was like, that was weird. But I was so like just lost in my own train of thought that I didn't think about it. And then then the smell hit me. Ah! And I, I was like, what in the God's name is that? And I turned and looked to my right, and I swear to God, not six inches off of my right arm are two horribly rotten bare feet Ugh. and a dude sleeping on the bench. Oh, God. You know, I was like, I, oh, whoa. Okay. I got on a train that smelled like <laughs> rotten feet yesterday. <laughs> and the whole time I'm thinking, you can get up and go to the next train, but will you find a seat on the next train? Right. I was like, I think I'll just, I'll just, I'll just live with it until I, until my stop. <laughs> so how long can you hold your breath? Right. <clears throat> I put, you know, I do, I bury my nose in my shirt. Kind of thing, like, <laughs> kind of makes you, like, I think about all the images from Japan and China where they all wear the, the masks yeah. everywhere. You know, they, they go. do that because they're sick and they don't want to infect anyone else. Talk yeah. about etiquette, man. Those people got it yeah. figured out. It's way different from here. Yeah. It's like <laughs> we're sick. We cough right in your face. <laughs> they sneeze right on you. But over there they wear like a little medical mask to protect you from their germs. So Wisconsin to mm-hmm. New York, was there anything in between or did you just make the big jump? No. From so I, well, like I said, I went to the performing arts uh, middle school and the high school, and um, I was in drama the whole time. I mean, I took art classes, too. They, like, they kind of make you take all of the different uh, art classes while you're there. And then when you get to high school, you get to pick which one you're going to focus on. And then, I mean, and then it's a regular school on top of that. Like, you're still learning you know, math, science, So you pick stuff. an emphasis, but you still have your general yeah, education exactly. courses. Exactly, exactly. And it, it really gives you a focus because... If you're not doing well in school, you're not allowed to participate in those activities that you're really interested in. Mm -hmm. So I find that it made people better students as well. Because like if I really want to participate in like an art show, I have to be a good student. Otherwise, they're going to tell me I can't participate. I could still take the art classes, but I can't go beyond that. Right. I guess it's the same for like athletes. Like, you know, if you're not doing well in school, they tell you, well, you can't play the game then. Yeah, I experienced practice, that. But you can't play the game, right? Well, I don't care about sports at all, <laughs> so that's not a really good motivator for me. Um, but then I I got accepted to a couple of colleges, um, one of which is NYU, and 
I really wanted to go to New York City. Like that was my ultimate goal. Get there. Just get there. Have and, you ever uh, visited before coming here? Yeah, for my mom brought me when I was 16 because she wanted to be comfortable with the fact that her little I was girls gonna, in the big bad city. Yeah, that I was going to move and leave her and move to New York City. And she wanted to see what it was like to see if she would be comfortable with it. How'd that go? And I think she, and, and to like expose me to it, to make sure that that's somewhere I really wanted to go. And I think it solidified my desire to be here. And it scared the crap out of her <laughs> even more. <laughs> Well, I think the simple truth is, is I don't think any mother is truly ready for their daughter to run off anywhere, whether it's New York or, you know, 10 miles down the road. I yeah. Think that departure from the nest is just hard for any mom. <laughs> I know. My poor mother. <laughs> She's all alone now. <laughs> I feel so bad. But, um, yeah, so I went to NYU. I was in the drama department. But I was... I. This NYU is different in all the acting schools because they have several. Like when you go to an acting like an acting school, it's usually just one kind of style, and they teach you that one kind of style. But right. NYU is unique in that they have several different acting departments, and there's several different styles that you can. And they, when you audition for the school, they kind of predetermine which one you're going to be in if they accept you. So. And it's, it depends on what kind of actor you are. Right. They're like, oh, well, we're gonna we're gonna put you in Meisner, and we're gonna put you at the you know the Atlantic Theater Company. Or you're multi talented. You do more than just act. You also direct. We're gonna put you in the playwrights program. Okay. So the playwrights, I ended up in playwrights <clears throat> because you got to do more than just be an actor. You got to do design. You got so I I was in the costume shop the majority of the time. And um, so I was acting, and I was doing wardrobe and costumes and getting my, like, general education. <laughs> so I really I enjoyed being at NYU. It was a really good experience. Yeah. How long was the program? It was four years. Four years? Yeah, typical four-year college program. And while you were there, were you able to participate in any theater stuff around town? Or were you pretty solely focused at school? I mean, there was no time to do anything but go to school and do the schoolwork. Yeah. There's really, I there's no time. I knew there's there were some people who would audition for stuff outside. And generally what happened is if they got cast in something, they would drop out of school. Right. And, um, yeah, there was just no time. So you finish NYU. Mm-hmm. What, what comes after that? Um, so... I started working for this store called Halloween Adventure. It's really, you should visit. You'll be amazed. It's the biggest, like, Halloween store you've ever seen. And it, it is, it's been there for fi- over 15 years now. Mm-hmm. And it's really, it's expanded in size. It's tripled its size since I started working there. It's tripled in size. And where is that located? <clears throat> it's um, in the Union Square area. It's on 4th Avenue between okay. 11th. I want to say between 10th and 11th, but there is no 10th Street because the store <laughs> is 10th Street. Gotcha. Um, <clears throat> so it's like kind of, it's over there. It's by Grace Church. Um, which I think is really odd because it's like Grace Church and then Halloween. And then right Gothic to Halloween. It. Yeah, it's so it's <laughs> strange juxtaposition, but it works. Well, that's and, New um, York. <laughs> so I worked there for 12 years. Wow. Yeah. I, um, I was a buyer and um, I worked in the office. Like I very quickly went from selling rags and bags to go, moving to the office and mm-hmm. going to trade shows and I was really heavily steeped in the Halloween industry and um, yeah and then I hated my life the more responsibility I got <laughs> the more I hated life I was like oh god get me out of here well, I sounds hate like this you're kind of moving more and more into the corporate side of yeah and it was terrible yeah. I was like oh the more, yeah, it's not that I don't like responsibility. It's that I didn't like working for someone else, making money for someone else. 
What's an and not reaping think, any benefits. I think that's an interesting thing because once upon a time, the American spirit was entrepreneurial. Mm-hmm. And like, the idea of opening your own business and having your own shop. I mean, that's what New York was built on, right? Like yeah. all the little mom and pop stores. Yeah, it's- but somewhere along the lines, you know, Rockefeller and those guys got a hold of our education system and by and large turned it into let's create workers. Mm-hmm. And we kind of lost the entrepreneurial spirit for a while, except I think in the creative world. Creatives, I think by nature, just kind of lend themselves to the idea of damn the man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I want to do stuff for myself that makes me feel invigorated and passionate and on fire. Yeah. So it makes sense. Like, cause I, I experienced it myself. I, I landed a, you know, six figure a year job a few years ago and worked in an office for three years and it was it's wonderful to have sucking. money, but that's exactly what I felt I like. I mean, I'm telling you, <laughs> the more money, they, the thing is like the more money I made, the less time I had to do anything. Mm-hmm. I was like, I was a district manager. I was overseeing several stores and I just wanted to kill myself. It was so yeah. boring. And I decided that I needed to to quit this life. Like I hated it so much. Was that a, was that a painful decision to come to? <clears throat> You know, no, because uh, I was like, what makes you happy? Like, rem- go back to the time when you were actually happy, like, and you did stuff that made you happy. What were you doing? And I was, I was creating stuff. Right. And I, I was like, I need to go back to that. I need to go back to that life, but I don't want to be a costume designer. <laughs> <laughs> that was never anything I really wanted to do. It's just kind of like where I ended up, you know? Right. Um, and I was done with costumes at that point. I like Halloween, like, please. I can imagine. So how did you, how did you move into makeup? So, well, when I was in high school, we, in, in one of my drama classes, we had to learn how to do, um, like theatrical makeup, old age techniques and Mm -hmm. things like that. And it was, it was something I really enjoyed doing. And one of my friends from high school actually went to college for makeup design. She went to Northwestern University, and they have one of the only college programs where you can in the United States where you can go and learn wig and makeup design. And um, that's where she went. <laughs> but that's where she went for her master's degree. Let me put it like that. Okay. And she moved to New York City, and she's a makeup artist in New York City. She's working on. I mean, she's one of the regular makeup artists on Lion King right now. So I remembered like how much I enjoyed that. And um, I was watching something. I think, it, I, I think cause at the time I think I was like binge watching Farscape and oh, I love Farscape. <laughs> I, noticed, Tell me about it. I noticed a few photos of you with Claudia black. Well, on your I website. got photos with every, just about every <laughs> single cast member of that show. We had uh, Gigi Edgley on the on the I podcast like a year ago. Gigi's she was wonderful. great. She's really sweet. Yeah, I see Gigi at the trade shows. Yeah, she's, she's just delightful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love her. Um, so yeah, I think I was binge watching that, and I was looking at the makeup, and I was like, you know, that is really fucking fantastic. Yeah, like I can do that. Yeah, it's interesting. You- that show was like touted about the puppets. Yeah, a- as it was launching. Yeah. But the makeup on that show was unbelievable. Let me tell you something. The thing that I love the most about that show is like, yes, there are puppets on the show. But when you're watching it, you don't even realize that they're puppets because you are so sucked into the characters. Mm-hmm. And you're like, like looking at it, you're like, oh, yeah, that character is a puppet. But I don't see a puppet. I yeah. see, you know, yeah, there were I see so incredibly Domino well done. Rigel. I, I see pilot. I don't see puppets. Yeah. 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 It was fantastic. I, I'm still to this day, like exposing new, new friends and stuff to that show. And I'm like, you've got to watch this. How can you not have watched this? <laughs> like, what are you talking about? I'm like, no, believe me. And we sit down and start watching and like, you know, a week later they're like, Oh my God, I binged the whole series. I'm like, I know. Right. Yeah. You're like, how did I miss this when it was on TV? That's- I'm like, that's what I want. I want to know how I missed it. I didn't. I didn't have cable TV at the time. I think <laughs> <laughs> I was young and poor and did not have cable. Um, that was the days before you could watch whatever you wanted to watch too. Yeah. You know, you, you couldn't just log on and download a show. Yeah, That's, if you missed it, you missed it. Yeah. yeah, you have to like buy the VHS tape. <laughs> I remember those. Yeah. 
Vaguely. I had a huge collection of VHSs <laughs> back then. Yeah, I moved to DVD as quickly as I could. And I, at one point, I had a like 3,000 disc collection of DVDs, which are all in a box now in my garage. Of course, because everything's digital. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, so Farscape kind of lit your fire for makeup. It did. It, yeah, it did, because I was like looking at it like, I can do that. I know I can do that. That doesn't look hard. <laughs> like, that looks like... And um, I quit my job and went to makeup school because I, I had this choice. I could keep my job and teach myself or I could do what I really wanted to do, which is get the hell out of there mm-hmm. and start something new, start a new chapter in my life. And that's exactly what I, I was like. No, I just got to quit. I'm going to go back. I'm going to go to makeup school. I'm going to like... I'm going to have people, I'm going to pay people to teach me the basics and I'll go from there. Mm -hmm. And how quickly did you find things kind of took off for you? Well, so I I went to, I went to makeup school and then um, a few months after graduating, I applied to be, there's this international makeup trade show. It's called IMATS, International Makeup Artist Trade Show. <laughs> and, um, they yeah, they don't to, get real they, creative with the names. No, they don't. <laughs> and they go to several cities uh, throughout the world. And um, I applied to compete in their student competition. And I competed um, in London in their student competition. And I won second place. And I was like, oh. Maybe I have some talent at this. Yeah. <laughs> but I found that I really, truly love doing makeup. Yeah. So... I did the competition and then I, um, I applied to, I tried out for face off, like what the hell? And I didn't get accepted for that season. Thank God. I would not have wanted to be on season five. That was the season where they brought back half of people who'd already been on the show. Oh, and right. The other half were newbies. I did no. catch a little bit of that season. Mm-mm, 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 mm-mm. I'm so <laughs> glad I didn't get cast on that one. That would have been a nightmare. Uh, Brian, um, Brian and Teresa, I remember they were like super excited that season because there were people who came back and yeah, they were like, oh my no. God, it's like, it's unfair even. <laughs> like, I know those okay. poor newbies. <laughs> um, so yeah, I didn't get, I didn't even get called back for that. Thank God. And then I didn't audition for the next one. I was busy with life and working and whatever and then I was like ah, I can't, I'll audition again I'll do it one more time I don't get it I don't get it I'm done with that um, and then I they called me back they were like we love you let's like I'm gonna fly you out to LA meet the, the, the producers you're gonna do another makeup a completely different one than the one you already did you'll have two hours to apply it uh, we'll take pictures we'll have somebody scrutinize it and I was like Ugh. okay um they do a psych test they make sure you are psychologically able to do this um which i I think is a good idea because if you don't have the constitution for it you really shouldn't it's a bit of a pressure cooker it really it's so stressful like it's it's unlike anything I've ever experienced before stress wise, because you're always like left not knowing and right. you're always just waiting to find out right. what, what's it going to be? Who's it going to be? Well, here's an interesting question for you. Like the season runs, what, eight weeks, nine weeks or something. How long does it actually take them to shoot a whole season? Well, they, it doesn't take them very long. They, they shoot back to back episodes. Like it's every couple of days they're right. shooting a new episode. Yeah, because I, I, cause I, I've talked about that with some friends of mine. I'm like, I'm sure they shoot these in like two, three weeks. <laughs> no, 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 it takes a little you bit know? longer. But like, I, I would say that you could get through two episodes in a week. But easily. If, you know, but it, for viewers at home, it feels like you guys are in yeah, that it's process like week for after week. months. Yeah. You know? And I'm like, no, it's. No, I was there but, for three months. Yeah. I was there for three months. Yeah. It was hard because you can't, like, they take away everything from you. You can't communicate with anyone back home. You don't have your phone. You, there's no access to a computer. That's got to be a really strange It's just existence. you and the other people that, are, that, are, that you're stuck with. 
like the other contestants. Strange little bubble. The cat, the crew members that escort you from here to there. <laughs> I'm serious. And that's it. That's your world. You have no choice but to like make friends with the people that are there. And Do you feel like the year from the first time you auditioned to the time that you got picked, do you think that year of like working on stuff and whatnot helped you out? Oh, yeah. It, I would have been probably the first one sent home if I had gone. If they'd picked me that first time, I would have been it. They would have, <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> yeah, and I would have... I would have not been able to like figure my way through that that first time mm-hmm. on season five. No, <laughs> Mm-mm. not with Roy and RJ making crazy crap. <laughs> the face-off experience did it help? Did it help your career after you came out? Or um, so this is it this, just a weird blip on the radar? Here's this weird thing about about the makeup community and people who work in this industry, they don't think very highly of the show or the people who participate in it. So a lot of the times when I'm talking to like other colleagues and other makeup artists, I don't mention it. Right. I figure I'm like, no, I don't want people to know. I don't want them to look at me any different. I don't want them to think any, it's weird, but I, I don't want them to think any less of me, you know? Right. Like I want, I want them to judge me solely on my work. <clears throat> and um, it's so strange, the, the attitudes between other makeup artists in the industry and, like, people who actually enjoy the show. Like, well, fans I, of the show, I, I have no problem talking about it. I think it. it's interesting because it's good for your industry for people to be aware of how much work goes into creating the creations. You know what, though? I also feel like it's responsible... To some extent, for the influx of people trying to get into the industry, exactly. Too. Right now, we have like this overflow of of people. Like this, the makeup schools are just churning them out. Like makeup schools are a business. They not really back in the old days. You, there was no makeup school. You kind of had to figure it out on your own, and right. maybe you'd find a mentor. Like maybe you would write to Dick Smith, and he would write you back and give you critiques. But it wasn't. It wasn't something you could go to school for. Right. It wasn't something you could, like, go, get into a classroom and someone could just teach you how to be a makeup artist. Like, that's... It wasn't... It, wasn't, it was unheard of. Like, no one did it. So, now you can pay whatever amount of money and go to makeup school and then move to L.A. and be one in, you know, a thousand fishes trying to get that makeup job. It's um, so I think it like it changed the industry to a certain extent. Maybe that's why makeup artists have like a bad feeling. Well, about I the wonder show. too. Like, it's an interesting aspect of a TV show like that where you take what is fundamentally a behind the scenes mm-hmm. part of production and make those people celebrities in their own right. Yeah, in front of the camera. Which kind of alters a little bit the perception of what you're doing. Like it's not really just about the work, maybe, and it's it's true, and it's about and you, and that's also, a little different from the way it, it usually is. Also, because it's a it's a competition based show, so and because they have to film a whole season, they don't give you the time that it would normally take to do something. So like right. sometimes you know ignorant producers would call up a makeup artist and be like, well, they can do it in three days on Face Off, and you're like. But did you see the finished makeup? Because it was not camera ready. <laughs> they never camera ready. Like, would you really film that? Yeah. Um, well, we have those discussions in San Diego. Um, so our film community there is kind of like being rebuilt from scratch because our film commission got destroyed a few years ago. And so there's all of us making short films, constantly making short films. But one of the things that kind of really got a lot of us back in the game is this 48 hour film project Mm -hmm. where you make a film in two days. And I just, just did it a few weeks ago and I love the process, but it's created like a generation of San Diego filmmakers who think they can do anything in two days. And I'm constantly like, "Eh, not really. (laughs) We can do some good work in two days. And you know, out of 140 teams, there might be two really good films, three really good films, but don't, 
think that everything should yeah, be done no. in two days. I think, I think the pressure of getting something done that quickly really teaches you a lot about what you're capable of and mm-hmm. like what you can do in a short amount of time. And that's why I do those competitions. Yeah. Like I want to see but where the chinks in the armor is. it's definitely not <laughs> the standard. Yeah. Like if you give me two weeks, just think of what I could do. Yeah. Like in two, in two days, that was it. And like, wow, I could do that in two days, but that's not a finished product. Like give me two weeks and you'll get a finished product. Exactly. So I think that's another thing that that makes makeup artists upset about the show is that it gives people an unrealistic expectation of what can be done. Right. I, I don't I, like, sometimes I say, Oh God, I got to employ that, uh, that 10 hour work day to my real life so that I can get everything done in one day. <laughs> but <laughs> the reality is, is that it never gets done like that. I don't, I can't work like that. Yeah. You can only push yourself that hard for so many days and then you yeah. just crack. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's not to say that I don't put in like really long. Some days I'm like, I'm in my studio from like 8 a.m. until 2 a.m. working because I have deadlines, you know? Mm-hmm. But. But you shouldn't not, always work that way. No. Yeah. No, never. Well, and I, I, I find creativity suffers the more I, the more I push myself to do things on super tight deadlines. Yeah. Because you start getting to the point where, like, just fuck it. It's just got to get done. Like, mm-hmm. uh, you know, what's the shortest route to the end? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you, yeah. you skip, you skip corners. And, yeah. And then, you know, I mean, the, and then the end result suffers. Yeah. And then for you and, like, for myself, like, anytime we put out subpar products, a, we're hurting ourselves long term anyway. Because yeah. that's what represents us out to the world, right? Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, it's, it's, fascinating all, all these competition shows you know I, I find all of them delightful in that they turn a, attention towards things that we do and you know things that friends of mine do but I do worry like that that it creates yeah. weird unrealistic expectations and it's the same sort of thing too with like YouTube like everybody thinks that like producing a commercial should be super easy because people are putting videos out on YouTube left and right every day and it's like yeah but that's YouTube. But, yeah, you want to put something on national television. Look at the production quality <laughs> yeah, of, of like, YouTube videos. Same, Come yeah. on. So the, the casual viewer doesn't understand the, the distinction or the difference necessarily. Yeah. Which also makes me wonder sometimes why we work so damn hard if they're all so happy with the crap that's on YouTube. <laughs> it's, it's so funny. So I have like, I, I do a lot of makeup during the month of October. Um, it's, obviously all Halloween based makeup and like for Halloween, I get an incredible amount of business Mm -hmm. and I always have to tell myself because I'm a perfectionist in my work. Like I just want it to be perfect. I want the makeup that I do even for a Halloween client to be amazing. And I have to tell myself sometimes they don't know the difference. (laughs) They don't know the difference. It's okay. It's weird. They're going to think it's fabulous. Even if you don't. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> because they don't understand. Yeah. And it's true. Like, I'll be like, oh, I'm not happy with that end result. And they'll be like, this is amazing. Thank you so much. And I'll be like, oh. <laughs> I started telling friends of mine, I'm like, don't nitpick your work in mm-hmm. front of casual people. Because mm-hmm. they're going to look at you like you're insane. Like, understand who you're talking to and adjust how you speak about your work based on their level of understanding of what you do. Yeah, exactly. Because you might lose business if you over nitpick in front of just a casual person who thinks you're, you know, the mm-hmm. cat's meow, right? Yeah. So <laughs> I always have to tell myself, like, listen, they don't, they don't know the difference. It's okay. Even if you're not happy, <laughs> they're over the moon for what you did for them. Yeah, you just gotta you just gotta, it's a different you gotta kind gauge of client. it off of their yeah, happiness. it's not it's not a movie producer. Like it's a different kind of client. Their expectations are completely different. Well, movie producers are never happy. <laughs> <laughs> That's a never ending struggle. Try to please They're always a movie happy producer. with me, okay? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've never had any complaints. <laughs> what do you prefer doing makeup for? Stage or or, or film? I don't really do makeup for the stage, quite no. frankly. There's uh, very little need for it here. Like, of of all of the shows that are on Broadway, I think there's three that have makeup artists. The rest of them, they all do their own makeup. Really? Yeah. That's kind of generally what it is. Like, they'll have someone design the makeup, 
and they'll come in and show everyone how to do it. And then they'll come back and make sure they're still doing it the right way or the same way that they've designed. But they don't, they don't stay and do the makeup every day. So theater treats most disciplines the same way they treat their directors. Come in, work the rehearsals, I think, be there for the opening, and then never come back. I think it's the history of theater, though. Like, it, it, it's always the actors have done their own makeup. Hmm. Always. I mean, when I learned how to do makeup, it was in an acting class. And that we learned how to do, like, old age makeup on ourselves. Well, I guess that's true. That's, I mean, when, that's when I yeah, learned. Yeah, and that's... That's, that's when that's, I learned makeup as well as when I was in college. That's, like, the history of makeup in theater, really. Like, to have somebody come and and do, like, prosthetics on you or whatever while you're on stage is kind of a new thing. But they had masks, like, back in the day. They just used right. masks. Right. You know, they had a the Comedia dell'arte they had a different mask for a different character that was it um so yeah i think that's why there's only so many jobs on broadway and my friend has one of them (laughs) (laughs) Uh, but in turn like film and tv i love doing i love doing commercials actually because the jobs are shorter (laughs) And the pay is still good. And the pay is phenomenal. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I do prefer commercials. I, I've actually been st- just started working for like doing little Comedy Central bits um, for like Funny or Die. And um, I think those are, they're a lot of fun. Yeah. Like doing, yeah, doing like sketch comedy, makeup for sketch comedy is fun because it, it's funny when it looks off, you know, <laughs> it's, it is like, that's the beauty of it. Like if I could, I would love to be like a makeup artist for Saturday night live. Yeah. You know, but that's like, you have to do things so quickly. Like they, I saw <clears throat> one of the first, uh, I'm at, I went to, um, the makeup department for SNL did a demo of how quickly they do a bald cap. And there was like four people putting a bald cap on one person. Right. And it was, and it was well, like, that is the pressure trigger because it's live be- TV. Yeah. And it's this on beautifully a like choreographed dance. They all knew what their job was in putting this bald cap on. And like nobody stepped over anyone else. And they like just put this bald cap on this person and like in such a short amount of time. It was awesome. But like, I still think it's funny. Like when you're watching the show and you see like, you see the weird edge. You see, see the like the mustache start starting through. to fall off. <laughs> like that's funny. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So I hope that you do more work with Comedy Central because it is fun. Yeah. Yeah. If you had your pick of any movie to work on, like like one of the big franchises, what franchise would you want to be? Associated like right with. now, it would have to be like the Star Trek franchise or yay, <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, have you seen the makeups from the newest? Yeah, I'm I, in I love. Saw the new film I am in love that or like Guardians of the Galaxy. Mm. Also, those makeup. I love the you know the sci-fi kind of makeup. I am in love with those makeups. Yeah, they I, are so I gorgeous. Loved, I loved what they did with. Um, uh, the girl from Doctor Who on Guardians oh, of the yeah. Galaxy. Uh, what is her name? Karen. Um, Karen Gillan. Gilliam. Yeah. Um, she didn't. Sh- she didn't shave her head this time around. I did. I did hear that. <laughs> Kudos to her for shaving it the first time, but right? boy, it brave. altered her look. <laughs> yes, it did. <laughs> but what they did brave. with her makeup, I know, was gorgeous. You wait till you see the new ones. Yeah. Yeah, I um, I worked on this film last winter uh, with Dave Batista who plays Drax mm-hmm, the Destroyer. Mm-hmm. And his makeup in Guardians is yeah. unbelievable. So it, this, um, this year, I, I went to Atlanta for an event, and Dave was filming Guardians of the Galaxy 2, and he invited me to come visit him on set. Nice. And I was like, well, you know what I would really love, Dave, is I would really love to see you get your makeup done. And he was like, oh, are you sure? Because that's like, like you have to be there at like 5.30 like in the morning. <laughs> And I was like, no, actually, it took a lot less time than that. You'd be surprised. And he was like, I was like, really? I was like, Dave, that's my life. Like, this is my life in the movies. I have to be on set at 530 in the morning. Like, it's not a big deal. Of course I'll come. It's like, 
because it's really a treat for me to see this process of the makeup getting done. And um, Brian Sipe, very talented makeup artist, was it was the lead of the team doing the makeup on Dave. And it was five guys doing his makeup. And like I said, it was like this beautifully choreographed little dance of these five people putting this makeup on him. And they had it done in like an hour and 20 minutes. Really? And I think it's like the makeup artist's goal is to do a phenomenal makeup job in the least amount of time. Because that's what the producers want. Right. Um, John Blake, who's the makeup department uh, head on that movie, said to us that Guardians of the Galaxy is a $20,000 a minute movie based on the budget. Right. So if there's any mistakes being made, someone's late for a minute. That's a $20,000 mistake. Wow. So you have to be on point. So to get that makeup done in an hour and 20 minutes is like, yeah, that's gold to the producers. You kidding me? It must have been amazing to get to sit and watch them do that. It was. It was a real treat. Like, and they treat. They were so nice to me, and they didn't have to be, but they were because they kind of did have to be because I was Dave's guest, <laughs> and the, this amazing energy on set where everyone is overly concerned with the happiness and the comfort of the actors. So, if you're a guest of one of the actors, they want you to be happy and comfortable too. Right. And which is unusual for me because I'm usually behind the scenes. I'm one of the makeup artists behind the scenes and no one gives a crap about my comfort. They're like, you go over there and do your job. <laughs> so it was odd for me. I've never been a, a set guest before where I got treated like a queen. It's so weird. <laughs> did you like it? I did. It yeah. was, it was very sweet of Dave to invite me and, it, and all the people who took care of him were also very sweet to me. So did you, uh, did you get to meet James Gunn? Like put a little word in for yourself? Like, hey, I did know, not. Guardians I, 3? No, just saying. I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> but there's two face-off alum working on that film. Um, I believe they were both doing... So all of the, all of the actors also have stunt doubles. Mm-hmm. And all the stunt doubles also have to be done up in makeup. Right. The same exact way. So I believe... Oh, that's fascinating so, like i didn't even think yeah, of that yeah like, so laura um laura for winner of season four, <laughs> yeah, that one. <laughs> five winner of season five what am i talking about oh the, the one that i didn't want to be on <laughs> the gauntlet season <laughs> so yeah she um she was working on it and there's another guy working on it too what's his name And it doesn't matter. It's okay. He was working on it too. But they were both, I think he was on the team who did the stunt doubles makeup for Dave. And she was on the team that did stunt doubles makeup for one of the other newer, new characters oh, that you get to one see. One of those. Yeah. Secrets. <laughs> I can't tell you. Do you know all the secrets? No, I don't actually. <laughs> <laughs> I just know it's a new character because I didn't recognize her from... The first film. Gotcha. I can tell you. No, I can't tell you anything. (laughs) (laughs) I think I signed a waiver. The old NDA. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. We run into that a few times on the show. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you can't get through the gate, the security gate of Pinewood Studios without signing a piece of paper saying you're not going to like tell anybody. You can't take pictures and you can't like it's a really tight set. Yeah. Yeah. You are not allowed. (laughs) Better put your phone away. I, I, I laugh a little bit because, you know, Kevin Smith went and visited the set of Force Awakens, right? Mm-hmm. And he was he signed all this shit, you know, not supposed to talk. And then he came out and did a video like, I just walked on the Millennium Falcon. It was amazing. And he's crying. And everybody <laughs> was like, oh, my God, you know. And then flash forward to Comic-Con last year and J.J. has the Star Wars panel right before Kevin Smith's regular panel. And he invites the entire audience out to a concert in the park. And oh, they, wow. And they played all the Star Wars music and had all the cast come out. But basically, he emptied Hall H right as Kevin Smith was walking on the stage. Messed up. And I've kept it in the back of my head this whole time. I'm like, that was JJ's way of getting back at Kevin for <laughs> blabbing his mouth. 
<laughs> well, he didn't give anything away except that he was there. Yeah, I, there wasn't uh, there wasn't a lot of information coming out of that set. Well, he wasn't supposed to say the words <laughs> Millennium Falcon. Yeah, I don't oh. think he was supposed to say that. <laughs> That's so funny. One of the one of the big makeup artists that I that I look up to and I love his work is Bill Corso. And Bill Corso is Harrison Ford's personal. Mm-hmm. So we anyone who knew him knew where he was and what he was doing, right? right. Like it was that wasn't a secret. <laughs> but it was a secret that Harrison Ford was in the movie, you know? Right. Um but like it's hard to keep that secret when this gut person is missing. Like, where are you? <laughs> oh, I'm off making magic somewhere and on a set of something I can't talk For about. Six months. <laughs> is it Star Wars? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's 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 a weird environment we're in where, like, you want to keep your audience surprised, mm-hmm. but controlling the flow of information in today's world is just. It's Damn hard. near impossible. It's hard. I mean, this movie that I worked on over the winter with Dave Bautista, it still hasn't been released yet. And I'm like dying to post photographs from it because like, it's work that I've done. And it's like my portfolio. Like I want to show people, <laughs> right. but I can't until this movie comes out. Like I can't show anyone. But if I do show a picture, I can't say what it's from and I right. can't put anybody's face in it. <laughs> so, <laughs> Which makes it all kind of so useless. so frustrating. <laughs> yeah. When, when's the film going to come out? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. Well, that's unfortunate. I know, but I can't wait. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I run through it with my indie films, you know, because you want to do the festival circuit. You know, you got to give your film like a year to do all that. Mm-hmm. Everybody's clamoring for footage. And it's like, I can't really give it to you guys until we're done with this. Because if that stuff ends up on the internet anywhere, then... Yeah. A bunch of festivals won't play your film. Right. Like if any of it shows up anywhere, there's some festivals who won't play your film if you put a trailer online. Yeah. It's, it's getting to be really yeah. bizarre and difficult to manage That's... what you're doing and, and please everybody. Mm-hmm. <laughs> As a it's producer, hard, that's the hardest part for me is just keeping everybody happy. What are the rules? I don't know. <laughs> um, so are you working on anything big right now? Um... I just did a sizzle that I'm not allowed to talk about, but it was interesting. It's a very interesting sizzle. I got to do a lot of special effects makeup for it, and I really hope that the network picks it up so that I can continue doing a lot of stuff. Um, I just had to turn a movie down, which broke my heart because it's it's a uh, Ron Perlman is slated Uh, to star in it, and he's also producing it, and I had to say no. That's a guy who knows how to wear makeup. Right, like, he does it all the time. Oh God, it broke my heart. I was like, "It's such bad timing," and there's no way I can spend three weeks out of town. Like, I have to be in town. I got so much stuff going on. Right. Um. Yeah. Other than that, I mean, I'm just I'm gearing up for the Halloween season. I got all these events asking me to like book out, you know, a bunch of makeup artists to do makeup for their events, and that's kind of what I do during the season, like. So it's kind of like, you know, retail has Christmas, makeup artists have Halloween, do big, big batch of your business during the Halloween season. I mean, I make a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. I make a lot of money. I've been building this business for myself for the last couple of years. I keep getting, um, like last year, Time Out New York did a little blurb on me and put a picture of one of my makeups. And then I got all these phone calls of people wanting that exact same makeup that they saw in the time out and i was like well i'm booked solid so i have to give you one of my other makeup artists because <laughs> that's kind of that's what i do like i can't do everyone's makeup on halloween right. i can do maybe 15 20 people maybe depending on what they want right uh, everyone else has i have to give build the work. a team yeah so i last year i had a team of 12 makeup artists working for me this year it'll probably be a little bit bigger than that i'll probably have like 15 16 well, see, people you're you're making yourself ready made for when James Gunn does call you for Guardians exactly. 3. Exactly. I'm like, oh, I got a team. I got a whole team. I can handle one person's makeup. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do it in 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we can do five people if we can do them all in 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be fun. 20 minutes. Impossible, by the way, to do one of those alien makeups in 20 minutes. Impossible. Yeah, well, that's barely enough time to say good morning to an actor. Right? <laughs> Nuts. 
Um, so where can people check out all your stuff? Uh, well, they can find me online. Um, my website is stellasmakeup.com. And I'm on Instagram. I post a lot of my work on Instagram. I also post a lot of pictures of my dog. Yeah, I had fun checking out your Instagram last (laughs) night. And I I post a lot of pictures of my dog, my work, and like New York City life in general. You should do like makeup on your dog. That's not, no, (laughs) that's not possible. My poor dog is going blind. Oh, I know. That's unfortunate. I know. Her poor eyes. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I like my Instagram. So you can check me out there, Stella Sensel. It's really easy to find. I'm really easy to find online. Just type in my name on any of the social media platforms. You'll find me. Cool. And they all have my website linked. So if you want to check out my website, it's there. And if you're in the New York area and you want something Deanna, get your makeup done. stellar for yeah. Halloween, like now's the time Look to contact me, me before you get booked up. Book me as soon as possible. I'm actually not taking bookings until mid-September. So we're almost there. Um, but yeah, well, mid September, I know it's, it is basically it's mid-Sept. the 13th. Yeah. So. I got a couple of days. I got to get my stuff together. I got to <laughs> book all 15 makeup artists before I start taking appointments. Well, I think I'm putting this episode up tomorrow. Okay. So ah. pretty much once you're listening to this episode, like ah. reach out. Funsies. I'm doing a podcast tomorrow too. Oh yeah. Yeah. My what? friend Jasmine, uh, Jasmine Ringo, she's also on Face Off. She's trying to do Face Off uh, reunions. So she's trying to get a bunch of cast members together to talk nice. on, on her podcast. That's cool. Yeah. So I have no idea who's going to be there tomorrow. <laughs> do you know what, she, what she's calling it? What the show's called? I, have, I don't know. Okay. It's Jasmine Ringo. Look her up. She does yeah. a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> she just started. I don't know who listens. <laughs> Well, uh, I don't know who listens either on mine. So really? Like, well, that's kind of the anonymous thing of the internet, right? Like, but you can I, tell I see how many downloads. people listen. I see, right? I see where they come from. Interesting. I don't know who they are. I love the anonymous nature of the internet. Yeah, I mean, but I love, I love that I have listeners in Australia and you know right? India. And <laughs> sometimes I just want to know who these people are. <laughs> like, I go through my Instagram feed. Like when people like my picture, I look at who these people are and I'll click on their Instagram. To, who is that? Who are you? Right. Where are you from? What do you do? Oh, really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I check them out all the time. I'm like, who are these people? Where'd you come from? It's like an interesting, globally connected, disconnected life. Yeah. It's like, I, I know of you, but not anything really about you. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I feel that way about a lot of people that I follow. That's why I started my podcast. Like I wanted to start to get to know creative people that are in my industry and have a chance to chat with them. Aww. So I'm, I'm, I also suffer from a certain level of social anxiety. So it forces me to do right. that too. <laughs> That's good. Me so. too. I don't like to go out and meet new people. But when I have to, I'm like, really though? <laughs> <laughs> so. I don't know what that, I don't know where that stems from. But I'm just like always like, can I just hang out with the people I know? Well, it's comfort, you know. Mm-hmm. It's like, so like coming to talk to you completely on my own today. It's it's not normal that I do the podcast by myself. Who do you have with you normally? Um, well, I have a four or five people who serve as co-hosts, and I oh. usually have at least one of them with me. And Carla, my producer, will show up when we do stuff in L.A. And interesting. Um. But, you know, I'm out here in New York on my own right now. So it's like, put up, shut up, go out and do it. <laughs> Who else are you talking to besides me? Um, I'm going to talk to T. Schreiber tomorrow from uh, the T. Schreiber Studios. Mm-hmm. And uh, Nathan Darrow. Um, he plays uh, Victor Freeze on Gotham. Oh, So I'll be meeting up with him on Thursday. Mm-hmm. Um, I met a playwright last night named Robbie Ramos, who I'll be uh, chatting with on Tuesday. Um, wow. Went and saw his play last night, which was really good. So, you know, just I'm bouncing around and yeah. I got feelers out for a few other actors and oh, nice. whatnot and just kind of figuring it out as I go. That's cool. I'm here until next Thursday, so I'm just kind of making the most of the time. So I I, uh, I was working a job in New Jersey last weekend, and then I work a job in Philly 
next next weekend. Mm-hmm. So I was just like, I'm not going to go home. I'm just going to hang out in New York and meet people and podcast and take photographs and do whatever. That sounds like the life, though. So I envy your life. <laughs> don't envy my life. <laughs> well, you can envy my life. I, you know, I just I muddle along and I make it up as I go, you know, and I don't make a lot of money these days, but. I'm really happy. That's all that Getting matters. back to what we were talking about yes. before. So True. Same here. I don't make a lot of money, but I'm happier. Yeah. I book just enough jobs on the road that I get to go see amazing things. So I, I spent the summer doing a West Coast tour. So I went from San Diego to Seattle and drove the truck, you know. So I took all the gear up to Seattle and, you know, visited Mount St. Helens and Portland and checked out where they shot the Goonies oh, <laughs> you know, did all that so stuff. Cool. And, Yay. So just making the most of everything. So trying to find jobs on the road that let me go see things. Yeah. So, you know, cool. Enjoying my life. Yeah. And I get to meet wonderful people like yourself. Oh, thanks. So, thank you so much for sitting down and chatting with me. Of course. Of course. And, uh, yeah, everybody, uh, cause I'm picking up a whole bunch of new New York listeners on this trip. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, make sure you check out Stella online and, and book her for your Halloween makeup. Cause, Absolutely. Uh, you know, I have seen her work and it's it is fantastic. So, and maybe someday I'll get to hire you on one of my films. That would be awesome. If I get uh, get a big budget going. Yeah. Well, so. you, you'd be surprised what you could do with a small budget too. <laughs> well, no, I know what I can do with a small budget, <laughs> but I can't bring you out to California on a small budget. No. So. <laughs> but we'll get there. We're all yeah. working for it. Yay. <laughs> So, thank you so much. Thank you. Hello there, citizens. I am the terror that flaps in the night. I am the floaty that will not flush no matter how many times you try in the toilet bowl of crime. I am Darkwing Duck. Telling you, please, talk hard and enjoy the mindgasm. (laughs) Whatever the heck that means. After all, you are watching Intellectual Podcast with your ears. (laughs) 